The naked bodies of five murdered women are discovered in just ten days. Totally unexpected. What are we dealing with here? What's happening in Suffolk? Sparking the biggest manhunt the east of England has ever seen. The Suffolk police went into overdrive. There was a serial killer on the loose in Ipswich. For the police, it became a race against time to stop the killer striking again. Who's going to be next? Is there any more girls missing? What's going to happen next? Am I going to be next? No. Yet their most powerful clues could only be seen through a microscope. There were two strands of forensic evidence which are going to be pivotal to this case. Fibre evidence and DNA evidence. This is the incredible story of how science helped crack the case of the Suffolk Strangler. Ipswich is a port town and no stranger to prostitution. But an escalating drug problem has seen an increase in the number of women working the streets. It's a situation that worries DCS Stuart Gull. There were in the region of a hundred or more sort of prostitutes working in the Ipswich area. A highly vulnerable and at risk. Monday the 30th of October 2006. Local girl, Tanya Nichol, fails to return home. But there's something her family doesn't know. Tanya's been leading a double life. How much? Fifty quid. That's all it is. Twenty for your life. Thirty. For the last few weeks, Tanya has been working as a prostitute to support her drug habit. It's a scenario familiar to many of the local working girls. The manner of Tanya's disappearance particularly concerns DCS Stuart Gull. She had literally disappeared off the face of the earth. Her phone records showed us a very flat line from the 1st of November, no incoming or outgoing movement of data at all and, and again that was a real cause for concern. Just over two weeks later, another girl, 25 year old Gemma Adams, has been reported missing. Like Tanya, Gemma is also working the red light district to pay for her drug addiction. It was then that we really started worrying. Are they still alive in a room somewhere, you know, or have Tanya and Gemma done this to a dealer and both of them are gone? You just don't really know when you're involved with drugs what the true reason is. As part of the investigation into Tanya and Gemma's disappearance, the police stopped motorists in the areas the girls usually worked. Any on, please, sir? You know where two girls have gone missing? No. Tanya, Nicole, Gemma Adams mean anything to you? No. Those names don't mean anything to me. All right, move on. Despite stopping over 500 cars and questioning 2,000 people, no new information about the girls is found. Tanya Nicol has now been missing for just over a month. Gemma Adams for 16 days. Hopes of finding them alive are beginning to fade. On the morning of the 2nd of December, water bailiff Trevor Saunders is checking Belstead Brook for blockages after heavy rains have caused flooding. Notice what I thought at, the fir at first was a, a dummy, a mannequin. So, got down into the water to get it out. On closer examination, Trevor discovers the true nature of what he's found. So I got down to pick it out and to 
clear the blockage and when I got down to her, that's when I realised that no, it weren't a dummy, it was a real body. And immediately thought to myself that I found one of the missing girls. Trevor Saunders' discovery is relayed to Stuart Gull. Apart from that, nothing. Girl, someone's called in, they found a body. Where? In a stream line, some fisheries near Hittlesham. Let's keep a lid on this until we're sure of the facts. Can somebody let Tanya and Gemma's parents know that a body has been found? I don't want them hearing about it through the news. What is it? Clearly, identification wasn't known at that stage, but you automatically fear for the worst, and you assume that it's perhaps either uh, Tanya or, or Gemma. Hearing where the body has been found, forensic officer David Stagg realises the magnitude of the task he's facing. The expectation of recovering forensic evidence from both the body and the, the scene where the body was found was actually quite low because depositing a naked body in running water, you're not going to have much forensic evidence left whatsoever. So we knew we were up against it right from the start. The body is identified as Gemma Adams. News of Gemma's death soon spreads. To hear that it was her, you know, just, uh, and well, you know, it's distraught me even, even now, you know, I don't like thinking about it, but, you know, it's, it just whips your insides out. The search for evidence intensifies. In freezing conditions, divers and forensic teams scour the area for almost a week. The search is about to be called off when a diver makes a shocking discovery. December 2006. Tanya Nickel and Jenna Adams have gone missing from the red light district of Ipswich. The naked body of Jenna has been recovered from a stream on the outskirts of the town. Then, during a forensic sweep of the area, a diver makes another devastating discovery. Forensic officer David Stagg recalls hearing the news. I remember receiving the phone call. Um, alerting me that the second body had been found. And when I asked where, I was told Belstead Brook. Immediately, the alarm bells were ringing. Less than two miles downstream from where Gemma Adams has been recovered, there's little doubt the second body is that of Tanya Nicol. Not in my wildest dreams did I anticipate that they would uncover the body of Tanya Nickel. We were now no longer dealing with uh, two missing persons. This was a, a double murder inquiry. Despite the similarities, the police know they can't assume the deaths are linked. I want an SIO assigned to each of these murders. I don't want anybody jumping to conclusions. We still need to keep an open mind that it could be just coincidence. Understood. Any news about the cause of death? Nothing concrete, sir. Bodies are in pretty bad shape. Have forensics turned up anything? Not yet. Seems the bodies were washed clean, but they're still looking. A post-mortem is conducted, but with the two bodies having been immersed in water for so long, the results are inconclusive. Forensic scientist Ray Palmer knows retrieving any evidence will be near impossible. Because they'd actually been present in flowing water for a number of weeks, any prospect of recovering fibres or other debris from the skin, or even DNA from the skin, in that period of time was virtually zero. The murderer's choice of location indicates to criminologist David Wilson that the police are dealing with a methodical and calculating killer. The fact that he had placed the bodies in water so as to destroy any forensic evidence suggested to me this was a very, what criminologists would describe as organized killer. By organized, I mean that he's very carefully thought through how he's crucially going to avoid being detected from the police.
With no evidence, the police need to find witnesses. They interview other women working in Ipswich's red light area. One of them is fellow prostitute, Paula Clennell. Well, how old do you know, Tanya? Yeah, well enough. She's on the streets. She's nice and nice. She had a cigarette with her, you know? Pretty girl. When did you not see her? So about a week ago. Maybe two. Can you remember exactly what date that was? Or what day, time? I think it was about 12.30. One year, maybe. Would have been in October. Burlington Road area. Burlington Road is one of only a handful of streets that make up Ipswich's red light district. The area is constantly monitored by CCTV cameras. To try and spot Tanya the night she went missing, police trawl through a staggering 16,000 hours of footage. Their dedication pays off. Tanya spotted the night she went missing getting into a dark car. But the image isn't clear enough to get a match for the car's registration plate. The efforts to identify the killer leave the police frustrated. Then, the shattering news of another body. The motorist had reported finding what appeared to be the naked body of uh, a young female. A totally unexpected, um, totally unbelievable. Mind begins to race. What are we dealing with here? What's happening in Suffolk? The discovery of yet another body, less than 48 hours after the start of the double murder inquiry, horrifies David Stagg. After the body of Tanya Nicole had been found, nobody had really envisaged that this spree of murders would actually continue. And it came as a real shock to us when the third body was found. Not just because it was a third body, but the manner of deposition was entirely different to the first two. The body has been found on dry land in a secluded wood, less than 10 miles from the centre of Ipswich. But it's the way the body's been left that disturbs Stuart Gull. She was naked, she'd been posed, and the offender had clearly taken some time to uh, lay her out. The killer has arranged the body in the shape of a cross. She was pristine. She looked like an angel. Distinctive tattoos on the body establish the identity of the third murdered woman as mother of one, 24-year-old Emily Alderton. No one had reported her missing. Like the other victims, Emily had also been working as a prostitute to pay for drugs. David Stagg knows, with a body on land, that this is the first real chance to recover clues to the killer's identity. The body of Annalee Alderton was deposited on dry land. That in itself was actually, from a forensic point of view, a breakthrough for us, because the potential for harvesting forensic evidence, not just from the body, but from the scene of the deposition, was much greater. The pathologist is able to determine the cause of death as airway obstruction. Strangulation is a peculiarly intimate form of murder. The killer is expressing through that method of murder the ultimate form of power and control over the life of another individual. The examination also reveals another tragic aspect to the murder. Annalee was three months pregnant. The revelation changes everything for crime reporter Josh Warwick. I think when it emerged that Annalee was pregnant, it brought a different dimension to reporting of the case and people's attitude. It brought a very, a very human and raw feel to the story all of a sudden. 
Breakthroughs still prove elusive. A witness reports seeing Annalie boarding a train exactly one week before her body was found. CCTV cameras on the train caught her as she made the journey. But no further information turns up. With the discovery of three murder victims in less than a week, all with such similar backgrounds, criminologist David Wilson has little doubt about the type of murderer the police are chasing. When the third body turned up, I think I was the first person to say there is a serial killer on the loose in Ipswich. And I think those words I chose with a great deal of care because they were, as far as I was concerned, accurate and they also should have suggested, which I think they did, the gravity of the circumstances. The grisly discovery of three bodies brings the world's media to Ipswich. What happened almost overnight as this crisis was developing was that the streets became filled only with one group of people and that group of people was journalists. Um, journalists seemed to be bumping into each other desperately hoping to find a prostitute that they could interview. Despite the fact that a killer seems to be targeting prostitutes, most of the girls continued to work the streets as usual. We were all worried and obviously scared, but we all had to go to work anyway, you know. We, we had drug addictions, we had addictions to feed. The police put out a clear warning telling the girls to get off the streets. But the warnings are ignored. Go. Two more girls have been reported missing. Annette Nichols. Second. Paula Clennell. The newly reported missing women are identified as mother of three, Paula Clennell, whom the police had questioned earlier about the disappearances, and 29-year-old Annette Nichols. Annette's disappearance hits Jade Reynolds hard. She was my best friend. Really, uh, the most amazing person I've ever met in my life. You know, she, uh, she changed my life for the better. Just six days before she'd gone missing, Paula Clamell had been interviewed by a local TV crew. Why, why well, have you decided to come out tonight? Because I need the money. I need the money, you know. Despite the dangers? Well, that has made me a bit wary about getting into cars, you know. But presumably you, you will do that tonight? Well, probably. Following the two new disappearances, the police organise a press conference. Reporter Josh Warwick is stunned by the turn of events. The shock and the, uh, the amazement of, of everybody, certainly ourselves, when uh, we were told that these are two other women that have been reported missing, both prostitutes, both drug addicts, was, uh, it was unbelievable, really. You know, it was just incredible. Less than 24 hours after the press conference, more news. Go, they found another body. Where? In the woods close to where Anne Lee Alderson's body was found. We're already sort of still reel, reeling from the discovery of uh, Anna Lee Alderton on the Sunday. Get as many people out there as possible, although the crime scene locked down and preserved. On our way. I was still surprised, shocked, uh, dismayed, and of course realised um, the severity and the magnitude of what we, what we were now dealing with. Even though police arrive at the scene within minutes of the reported sighting of a body, cameras are there to meet them. I will, I will need you at some point to go, all right? A police helicopter is scrambled to assist the search. 
It's confirmed a body has been found in woodland, just six yards from the edge of the road. The helicopter observation team relay images back to police headquarters. I can remember looking at the screen and seeing what, what clearly appeared to be the, the dumped and crumpled body of a, of a naked female. But Stuart Gull is soon to see yet another, even more harrowing image. Winter 2006. In just six weeks, five women have disappeared from Ipswich's red light district. The bodies of three women have been recovered. A fourth body has just been found in Woodland. And from the air, the police continue to search the area. For helicopter observer Maggie Williams, it's a search that'll take a devastating turn. I put the camera onto the first body. And we decided as a crew that we should really search the rest of the wood. And as I swung the camera around, panned the camera around, and came into view on the screen was another body. And that was, yeah, the realisation, the gruesome discovery that yes, there were two bodies there in the same location, fairly close to each other. Images from the helicopter's camera are relayed to the Suffolk Police Headquarters. It probably took a few moments for the pennies to drop, but it then dawned on me we now had a fourth and fifth victim. That was a particularly difficult time. The police soon confirm the bodies are those of Paula Clennell and Annette Nichols. That's the one that hit me the worst, and still does to this day, is Annette. I can't believe she's dead. I can't believe she's gone, really. don't want to believe it, but I have to. A post-mortem shows Paula Clennell died following compression to the neck. But Annette's death remains a mystery. Tragically, all five of the missing women have been found dead. Stuart Gull reluctantly announces the police are looking for a serial killer. Whilst we only had a cause of death for two, in all probability all had died as, as a result of some form of interference with the airway. So you put all of that together and I think quite rightly we drew the conclusion that we were looking for just one or more persons who were involved together uh, in the abduction and murder of all five women. 600 officers and staff from within Suffolk are now assisted by a further 500 from around the country. It's the biggest police manhunt the East of England has ever seen. With the announcement that a serial killer is at large, the media attention dramatically increases. I think you'll agree there's little doubt that the murders are the work of one person or persons working together. We had a number of people of interest um, a small number at that stage, but it's a very uh, methodical, very sort of scientific process that you need to go, th go through. You can't declare everybody a suspect, uh, uh, um, otherwise you make no progress at all. One name seems to offer itself up. Following an interview with a newspaper in which he admits to knowing the five victims, 37-year-old supermarket worker Tom Stevens is taken into custody. In custody and helping police with their inquiries, the man who lived here is being held by police hunting the Suffolk serial killer. The police had to arrest Tom Stevens on that occasion because if in effect he said, I knew all of these five women, they've all been back to my house, I do not have an alibi for the nights that they went missing. In those circumstances, the police would have been bonkers not to have arrested somebody who's openly saying that. Without solid evidence, the police know they'll soon have to let Stevens go. Then, the forensic team take an extraordinary step forward. 
tiny amounts of DNA are retrieved from the bodies of Annalee Alderton, Annette Nichols, and Paula Clemmell, the three women found on dry land. My initial feeling was, was one of surprise, bearing in mind the very hostile environment that these young women had been found in. I wasn't over optimistic that we'd recover um, forensic material as quickly as we did. The forensic team's objective is to see if this DNA is that of the killer. But there's a problem. There may not be enough DNA to examine accurately. To be able to identify the DNA's genetic fingerprint, the team need a certain amount of DNA. By using a technique known as polymerase chain reaction, the strands of DNA retrieved from the bodies are copied over and over again, providing the team with enough genetic material to analyze. The findings stun David Stagg. I remember when um, I was notified that we had a DNA hit uh, that linked firstly two of the bodies and then subsequently all three of the land deposited bodies and initially it was a feeling of disbelief. It's a one in a billion result. The DNA retrieved from the three separate bodies all link back to the same person. But who? The samples are checked against the National DNA Database. Gov, forensics managed to pull some DNA off one of the bodies. Have they found a match with the DNA? Yeah, they have. Tom Stevens? No. Local man by the name of Stephen Wright. Steve Wright wasn't on our radar at that particular time. He was already in the system. He'd actually been stopped on an anniversary road check in respect of the disappearance of Tanya Nicol. All right, move on. It's quickly established that Wright works locally as a forklift driver and lives on London Road, one of the streets that make up Ipswich's red light district. Put him under 24 hour surveillance, see what turns up. Got it. The Suffolk police know Wright's arrest has to be handled carefully. Wright is placed under 24-hour observation. Once the suspect had been identified as Steve Wright, there was an incredible amount of planning went into the arrest phase. And from our perspective, the real detail around it was how were we going to deal forensically with his house, with his car, with him when he comes into custody. By giving the forensic team time to prepare for Wright's arrest, Stuart Gull knew he was taking a calculated risk. Having deferred the arrest of Steve Wright for 24 hours, I effectively put a ring of steel around him. I couldn't afford for him to be at large. With the forensic team's preparation complete, the police arrive at 79 London Road in the early hours of the 19th of December. Stephen Wright? Yes. Stephen Wright, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murders of Tanya Nicholl, Annalee Alderton, Gemma Adams, Paula Clannell and Annette Nicholls. The 48-year-old man was arrested at his home address in Ipswich at approximately 5 a.m. this morning, Tuesday the 19th of December. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you fail to mention something that you later rely on in court. He has been arrested on suspicion of murdering all five women. Police conduct a background check of the man they believe capable of killing five young women. Born in Norfolk in 1958 as one of four children, Wright was to lead an unhappy childhood, with his mother leaving home soon after his eighth birthday. 
With no qualifications, Wright drifted from job to job before working as a steward on the QE2 for six years. In 1988, Wright set himself up as a pub landlord, but with little success. With two failed marriages and a mounting gambling debt, Wright found work as a barman at the Brook Hotel. After he was caught stealing 80 pounds from the till, his DNA was entered into the national database. A few weeks before Tanya Nicholl went missing, Wright was to move into 79 London Road, at the heart of Ipswich's red light district. What's intriguing about serial killers is not the fact that they are the epitome of evil, but rather they are the banality of evil. It's their ordinariness that sticks out. And when I first got to know more about the background of Steve Wright, what struck me was again that sense of the everyday nature of who serial killers are. Wright is questioned by the Suffolk police. Come on, Steve. You're telling me you've never even been tempted to go with a prostitute. No comments. When he was arrested, he said no comment during the first eight hours of interviews. You need to speak to us, Steve. You need to tell us what was going through your mind at the time. No comment. He's not going to engage with you. He's not going to engage with me and uh, help uh, resolve the puzzle, the puzzle of why he committed the crimes. We've got the last girl to go missing with your DNA, and the one before with your DNA, both on their naked bodies. And how can that be? No comment. Even without a confession, the DNA recovered from the bodies is proof enough for Stuart Gull to announce that Wright has been charged with the murder of all five women. And Tom Stevens is to be released. Wright's trial is set for January 2008. The pressure is now on the forensic teams to find conclusive evidence linking Wright to the five murdered women. Police impound Wright's car. As part of our forensic strategy, we identified Steve Wright's car as a, a key exhibit that needed to be examined in, in fine detail, not just for fibre evidence, but evidence of any other transfers. But there's a potential problem. Neighbours report seeing Wright obsessively cleaning his car at all times of the day and night. Undeterred by Wright's efforts, the forensic team set about the painstaking task of lifting fibres from the car, in the hope they'll be able to match them with fibres found on the bodies. Their efforts finally pay off. The first significant finding that we came up with related to the tapings that had been taken from Annette Nichols. What we found on these tapings was a fake fur fibre. When we came to look at Steve Wright's vehicle, we found two of these fibres inside the footwell which matched the fake fur fibre from Annette's tapings exactly. The fibre analysis team then makes another critical discovery. What we found on tapings from the rear seat were a number of very, very tiny flakes of blood. Completely unexpected finding, but nevertheless highly significant. By recombining the individual flakes of blood into a single droplet, enough DNA is recovered to allow a match. The blood belongs to Paula Clannell. A 
and when Wright's fluorescent jacket is subjected to microscopic examination. More of Paula's blood, as well as that of Annette Nichols, is found. I did a totally new complexion to the forensic evidence against Steve Wright because whereby we'd earlier had evidence that could be explained away by general contact with these people, innocent contact uh, as perhaps a customer, the transfer of blood was something that potentially was far more sinister. With Wright's make of car now known, the CCTV footage is re-examined. His Mondeo is spotted leaving Ipswich the night Gemma Adams failed to meet her boyfriend. The model also matches the car Tanya Nickel was seen climbing into. The police now have compelling evidence linking Wright to Annalie Alderton, Paula Clemmel, and Annette Nichols. But a positive link to Tanya Nickel and Gemma Adams, who were found in running water still remains elusive. Without that link, the entire case against Wright could be in jeopardy. Forty-eight-year-old Steve Wright has been arrested on suspicion of murdering five women. Forensic evidence has linked Wright to Annalie Alderton, Paula Clemmel and Annette Nichols, the three victims found on land. But recovering clues from the first two bodies has so far proved impossible. It was vital that we actually linked Steve Wright to the murders of Tanya Nicole and Gemma Adams. We knew that there would be very little chance of getting any DNA transfers to the bodies because they've been deposited in water, but fibres could be trapped in their hair. And that was the target area that, that we, we decided was going to give us the best potential forensic evidence. To try and establish a link between Wright and the first two murders, the forensic team set about collecting everything caught in Tanya and Gemma's hair. They extract over two kilograms of debris. Sifting through the material, the team then spend weeks microscopically examining every tiny particle. Against all the odds, they find what they're looking for. Coloured fibre trapped deep in Gemma's hair. In particular, we found blue polyester microfibres which matched Steve Wright's tracksuit bottoms. We found red acrylic fibre which were present in Steve Wright's car and on his sofa in his living room. But it's to be a single fibre extracted from Tanya's hair that will provide the final link in the forensic chain. Well, in the case of this fibre here, uh, we recovered this from the uh, hair debris of uh, Tanya Nicol, which is a, a black nylon fibre with a very distinctive cross-section and this type of fibre is very commonly used in the construction of carpets. But where did the black fibre come from? Once again, Wright's Mondeo provides the answer. The fibre matches those in the car's carpet. That was crucial to us because it put Tanya to his car, but it begs the question, how on earth has carpet fibres got in her hair? There was only one conclusion uh, that we could come to, and that is her head had been in forcible contact with the, the footwells of that car. Uh, that could either have been during the uh, strangulation process, or as the body was actually transported to the point of deposition. The forensic team now have good evidence linking right to all five victims. On the 14th of January 2008, the trial of Steve Wright begins. We were under intense pressure and scrutiny. We felt the weight of expectation. But of course, until the evidence is delivered before the jury, you really don't know 
which way the case is going to go. Wright pleads not guilty to all five charges of murder. For 15 days, the prosecution lay out the forensic and CCTV evidence against Wright. On the 7th of February, Steve Wright takes the stand in his own defense. He tries to offer a plausible explanation why his DNA may have been found on the murdered women. I had sex with Gemma Adams in the back of my car. Wright also admits to picking up Tanya Nickel, but insists she was only in his car for a brief period. When she got in the car, she had acne on her face, and it put me off quite a bit, really. I thought Steve Wright was particularly cruel in his description of Tanya Nickel. That seemed to me to be a revealing insight into the psychological process that he had gone through to objectify those young women, thus making it easier for him to kill them. But Wright's explanations soon start to fall apart. Under the barrage of questions that came towards him, he literally could not maintain any control as the horrible, dreadful truth seeped out to the extent that he started to say, No, I did not. I can't answer that. I couldn't say. You might say that. I don't know where the blood came from. The trial lasts for over a month. On Thursday, the 21st of February, after just six hours of deliberation, the jury returns to deliver their verdict. My heart was racing. Um, and I was shaking. I tried to pour myself on water, but, but was unable to do so. It was just um, extremely tense, extremely nervous. Weight of expectation was pretty immense. Wright is found guilty on all five counts of murder. When the guilty verdict came in, there was a, a tremendous amount of relief for, for a start, but also a tremendous amount of pride, particularly from the forensic side, because we knew we played such an important part in the investigation. The judge hands Wright a whole life sentence. Steve Wright will die in prison. This was about bringing a serial murder to, to justice and justice seemed to be done. But more than anything, um, uh, relief for the families of it. They can now bring some, some closure to a very difficult period during, during their lives. Today, Ipswich's red light district has all but disappeared, helping erase the memory of those ten days in December. But for some, the emotional scars left by the death of five young women still run as deeply today. People want to see me cry, they can see me cry, you know, because this is real, this is what happened, you know, these people I knew, and I'm not going to not cry because of it, you know, they were my friends. That's mine and Gemma's tree. No matter what her what her job was, what she'd done, she was still a human being and a young one at that. So hopefully every year that will be in full colour, just to bring the roginess back to her cheeks wherever she is now.